Well, as has been posited in that previous conversation we had, insecurity is intricately tied to economic insecurity. And so let's talk some business this morning, uh, especially about the Africa Free Trade Agreement that's been ratified and supposed to take off January 2021. That's actually less than two months from now. So many questions, one of which is, are we ready? And if we are, what do we need to do to maximize? We have two gentlemen joining us. So we begin with, the, with Professor Jonathan Aremu, who is a professional of international, professor of international economic relations at Covenant University. He joins us from Abuja studio. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we also have Thank you. the General, the Chief Executive Officer, GDL Asset Management Limited. He is also an economist, Kola Aye. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. Well, this is something you have talked about quite a few times before now. So here we are now, about to take off in January. Right. Are you hopeful? Okay, thanks. If you first of all permit me to digress briefly, because I think the African Free Trade Agreement is about um, the well-being of Africa. I've been very sad since yesterday, because Africa lost a very great son, um, General J.J. Rollins. And even though it's not part of what we want to talk about, I just want to pay tribute to a worthy African patriot. Um, sadly, there are very few of men like that left in Africa, and we just hope that we can groom some of them. Because without them, it doesn't matter what kind of policies we have, we'll not get very far. Now, on the African Free Trade Agreement, we have a big problem in Nigeria and in Africa. And we need to think very hard about the relevance of the solutions that we proffer. The essence of free trade agreements is to reduce barriers, to eliminate barriers to trade, and to facilitate exchange of goods and services amongst countries. Before you talk about facilitating trade, it does mean that you have a high level of production. I personally don't understand what the fixation is with trade and exchange in a continent where the big problem actually is the level of production. Sub-Saharan Africa is about 13% of world population and just about 2% of GDP. What is the inhibition? Um, let me get you. When you say inhibition, is it inhibition to trade or to production? To the production that should facilitate the trade. So when you are at a stage where you have problems with production, then you go to what the problems with the production. First of all, Africa is characterized as having 18 fragile nations with about 11 or 12 of them also extremely poor. What are the things that are constraining production? Is it trade that is going to move um, generation of power in Nigeria from 5,000 megawatts to 50,000 megawatts? Hell no. No. I mean, and I wind time back. You know, in a sense, the ECOWAS Treaty is a form of a free trade zone. The ECOWAS ar arrangement was supposed to facilitate more trade and free movement of goods and persons between the countries in West Africa. So let's roll time back. How many West African countries have experienced substantial economic progress as a, of, as a result of ECOWAS? I don't think the jury is out. I think, the, I, mean, I think the jury has spoken. West Africa isn't materially better off because of ECOWAS. And you know one of the things that makes you wonder whether we are prepared? As we speak, we have a border closure. This is October. We have a border closure, and two companies have just been given a special permission to move good across borders. And we are talking, we're supposed to talk with excitement about an African free trade agreement that should commence in January. I mean, with due respect, I don't know 
I've tried to get a little about the details of that agreement, but Africa's problem is not trade. My prognosis is that it is very likely that at best, a country like Nigeria may not be better off from the free trade agreement if care is not taken. If the free trade agreement allows some neighboring countries to be a staging post mm. for production, so to say, that will then be moved into Nigeria, we just might be worse off. And I think that's one of the issues Nigeria had, which seemed to drag our feet in trying to ratify it. But, Prof, uh, it would seem Mr. A has put some cold water, you know, because there was some excitement in the air for people, businesses thinking, how do we latch on, uh, you know, to this after? But clearly he has raised some major issues. He believes that Africa's problem is not trade but production. So with this after the ratifying and eventual kicking off in, in, in January 2021, do you think we're putting the cart before the horse in this case? Thank you viewers and thank you channels for opportunity granted me to be able to speak on this subject. Let me say this that I congratulate the entire Nigeria for taking this boost step. The discussion has been on, I've come to your TV quite a lot of time to be able to hear my view on this. There are certain background that we need to know about situation in Africa. Uh, number one, uh, we have about 1.3 billion people, and number two, 55 countries, many of them very small. And unfortunately, we are occupying 20% of the earth's surface, yet, just as the former speaker said, we are just merely contributing 2.4% of the global GDP. And in fact, our trade contribution to the global trade is even less than 3%. So we see and 41% or even more of Africans are living below the poverty line of $1.90. This is the problem we find ourselves. And two presidents talk uh, when the issue of African continental free trade uh, started, the president of Kenya, that it doesn't make sense that we trade with Asia, we trade with China, that's in Asia, we trade with European countries, our former colonial master, we trade with America. But so difficult to trade with ourselves. What is happening? Question, Charity uh, begins Prof, at Just home? a moment, Prof. That, that's a big question that a number of people are also asking, but it's a question that we will explore answers to when we return from this break. Just stay with us. Thank you for staying with us, Prof. So, so that we can make this uh, discussion useful to the authorities, uh, we, we know that there are so many issues to resolve and so many problems and all, and then you have begun by citing some of the uh, good things about this whole idea. But then why are some people, you know, cautious? Well, there is need for caution in everything, every step we take in life, uh, particularly when it involves international treaty, because there's a principle in international law that says pacta sun savanda. What is pacta sun savanda? It means whatever you agreed upon must be obeyed. So there is need for caution. But what we are saying is that why should we not be interested in trading among ourselves? And that's, I mean, and the journey is not just now. It had been long. The first important meeting was held in uh, Lagos, Lagos Plan of Action in 1980, that put six steps to get this thing done. Afterwards, a decade later, um, the African Economic Treaty was finalized in Abuja. So it is not now. And in each of these steps, there are procedures. It's only in 2012 that there was a new, renewed effort to be able to get this done, which led to African continental free trade area that started negotiation 2015. There is need to be conscious, and that is why Nigeria has been very conscious while others were signing the agreement on the 21st of March 2018, right? And then later on, on the, on the 7th of uh, July last year, the president signed that we are going to be part of it, but he set up National Action Committee to be able to look at every area where Nigeria thinks that this thing we need to exercise caution. So we have exercised enough caution. As I'm speaking to you now, 
even with that African continental free trade area, we have a lot of companies in Nigeria that have affiliate all over Africa, right? But they are operating without all the provisions which African continental will give them. So these companies like Dangote, like UBA, the Guarantee Trust Bank, they'd be better off when there is a, an environment that gives them a better opportunity than the one they are operating in. So I think that why there is need for caution, we do not because of caution say that no, we are not going to be trading with ourselves. We prefer now, trading with America. Prof, we prefer trading with European Union. Now, Prof, prof speaking, no, yeah, speaking no, specifically, yes, Prof, uh, one of the things that uh, our Lagos guest, uh, Mr. A. A. had raised is that, look, one of the challenges that we need to confront now is to even be clear what is at stake. Is it the trade that is at stake? Or the production. You have also alluded to the fact that we, we, we barely trade with, it, with ourselves, just about 2% of trade in the whole globe and all of that. That underscores something important. While Africa is very rich in the raw materials and the mineral resources, Africa is not doing so well or hasn't been doing so well as far as production is concerned. So how then will this trade work well when we do not have as much capacity to produce. I very much agree with you and agree with the last speaker that our capacity to produce is not to the optimal uh, potential that God has given to us. But this is one of the things that we are saying, that with a free trade area, right, there will be opportunity to produce because you know that you are going to have opportunity to sell the product. Even after this stage one, we are going to stage two of African continental free trade area that is talking about investment protocol. That is today you can invest in any part of Africa and that will give a lot of opportunity for vertical integration of economic activity that will enhance production. So the production you are talking about, yes, we may have infrastructural difficulties, right? But we are saying that we can actually resolve that. We have a lot of African countries also that have this difficulty, maybe ours is not going away quickly. But government, uh, before going into saying that they want to ratify, they know that they have to actually ensure that some of the infrastructure uh, problem will actually be confronted. And I think they are confronting some of these things. Uh, I think so. And I believe that with greater effort and people, the private sector, actually telling government what they need to do, we are going to be okay. But let, the production let, you are talking about, yeah. I think it's very crucial, very, very important. I All right. Agree. Okay. Let, let me, Mr. A, um, perhaps one of the ways in which one can begin to look at how productive and how useful and how sustainable this agreement would be for the African continent is to have perhaps economic hubs, as has been you know, suggested. For instance, you've cited earlier the example of the West African economic hub. There is East Africa, there is Southern Africa, there is Northern Africa, and all of that. Is that in any way, because, I mean, it is clear that every country wants to protect itself first yeah. of all. So uh, if one country is trying to protect itself and the neighboring country is also trying to protect itself, it's going to make cooperation sure. pretty difficult. Yeah. So. Is there any way that the, the economic hubs, you know, you know, regional economic hubs in Africa can help, if that is in the thinking at all? Okay, I, I mean, let me, let me be clear. Trade is important. Trade can be a catalyst for economic growth. But the simple logic I'm putting forward is that you can only trade what you produce. And if you have a lot of structural rigidities, creating, investing a lot of time and effort on providing a framework for trade may be a misdirection of effort. Let me give an example. In West Africa, mm. we produce 70% of the world's cocoa and less than 10% of its chocolate. That is tragic. Let me just quickly mention like three or four things. The kind of things I would love to see Africa do is, for example, ECOWAS to say, over the next five to 10 years, we will move production of chocolate from 5% to 50%. That's definite. That will be a lot of value. You see, if we are now trying to see how Cameroon 
Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Nigeria, those are the major producers of cocoa, need to collaborate to make that happen. That's where we are. Let me give you an exa another example. When I was growing up, we clothed ourselves significantly. Textile was a large employer of labor. If the hubs, South Africa and Nigeria, were to say, what do we need to do so that Africa can clothe itself? You know, that's definite effort. Let me give you another example. When I was growing up, Pan assembled Pojo in Kaduna. Von assembled um, Volkswagen in, um, Agba, in, in Agbara. Leland assembled trucks in Ibado. Anamco assembled trucks in a number of states. Even if assembly is low value added, at least some people were being employed. So if South Africa and Nigeria say, how many cars and how many trucks, how many buses are in Africa? And how do we, even if we don't manufacture, how do we assemble them in Sub-Saharan Africa? That's a step forward. You see, when we now start to get to a point where our production is getting saturated, and there is need for exchange, then the trade becomes an, a more important thing. Let me say something. I'm not saying trade is not important. I'm saying the world system is rigged against Africa. Let me say one last thing. Do you know what even the, the World Bank document on, the, on ACFA says? It says it will lead to a, a growth, additional income of four. $30 billion by 2035. That's 15 years. In 15 years. Now, out of that 435, about 200 out of it is forged, um, it's fuzzy arithmetic. Say it's going to be from um, efficiencies in custom procedures. Well, you do, just, just a quick one. You talked about some infrastructural deficiencies. Yes. Is that for the countries or for the regions or for the continent itself? I think that the continent is made up of regions, made up of countries. All of us in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, except South Africa, we have very low per capita power production. You see, these things that you are pointing out that is a problem, is a, pro is a problem across the continent. Those problems need to be addressed. Uh, you know what I was going to point out? When you take the 200 billion out of the one, um, uh, the 450 billion, and you project what you win in 2035, it's like a per capita increase in income of 5,000 per head per month. Mm. I mean, is it worth that effort? Is that why we should create this huge investor, something that will, in, in, will significantly improve income by 5,000 naira per month by 2035? I mean, looking at the, the specific objectives of AFTA, I mean, you've said you're not against trade. You just feel that some things need to be put in place Precisely. before we start trading. You see that, first, it's meant to progressively eliminate tariffs and non-tariff barriers to trade in goods. But then, regarding services, it says progressively liberalize trade in services, not, not eliminate tariffs and non-tariffs, and then cooperate on investment, intellectual property rights, and competition policy, cooperate on all trade-related areas, cooperate on customs matters and implementation of trade facilitation measures. But don't forget, Nigeria's borders are still closed. So if we're going to say this will begin January, we need to open our borders, right? Yeah. Well, clearly, it appears as though the government is still dragging the feet on that. I mean, the closure of the border is an indication of where we, where we are at and what our problem is. Last year, what was the issue? The issue was, they said, when we raise tariffs on rice, it finds its way through our borders because our neighbors then lower um, those tariffs, getting a lot of um, the products. I mean, what, I'm, I'm, what you just said is picturesque. We just signed a free trade agreement which says we want to trade, open our borders. Our borders are closed. And I, I want to, in agreeing with prof let me say one thing trade is important but trade cannot become important precedent to production we don't have the products the things we are made to celebrate actually just rigs the system against us you know agric agric employs 28 percent of the world's labor force 
but it's barely 4% of the world's GDP. Just a quick one uh, before we go to Prof. Uh, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, you know that the AFDB has been coming up with certain programs to address some of these things that you're talking about, Clothe Africa, Freed Africa, Power Africa, and all of those things. How useful do you think those ones by that multilateral institution can be? How useful can it be? How helpful, how productive can it be in helping to raise this production capacity? Did you see the problem that they current AFDB president had in getting reappointed. Anytime Africa wants to do something that the, multi that the global institutions are not against, they should go and check it again and be sure it's in their interest. Those things that AFDB wants to do, those are the things that Africa needs. Power Africa, feed Africa, Clothe Africa. But the thing is, AFDB can't do it alone. And I'm, I do not seek to say that AFDB is even the most efficient of institutions. That is what we should make effort to get the leading private sector lights in Africa to lead. That's where we need effort. You see, what I'm saying is, do you know how much of a bureaucracy the, EEC, the um, European Economic Commission is? That is the big effort that supervises the European free trade zone. We don't need that kind of effort now to supervise trade. We need that kind of effort and investment hmm. to catalyze production. But there, there, there's, there's another you know, issue that, has, that might be an impediment, yes. which we need to address. Let me take that up with, uh, with Prof. Prof, you remember that there were issues, I mean, those issues in Ghana are still there with Nigerian businesses there right now. And you also recall what happened as far as uh, Nigeria and South Africa um, is concerned, Nigerians in South Africa having uh, the kind of experiences that they had, Nigerians in Ghana having the kind of experiences they, they're having, especially as it concerns their businesses, which is trade. Now that we have that on the one hand, and we have signed the after deal, ratified it to begin in January, how do we marry these two seemingly conflicting issues? Yeah, that is uh, conflicting. I agree with you seriously. And um, looking back into ECOWAS, um, we are Ghana, Nigeria, and the 13 other countries are member countries. Uh, the issue of what is happening in Ghana shouldn't have come on board. Why? Because when the matter started, um, for those of us working in ECOWAS uh, Commission, we equally actually refer the Ghana Investment Promotion Commission to certain relevant article which have been actually signed by head of state with respect to uh, um, movement of people and their business and other previous protocols, particularly uh, we refer to the Supreme Act on Investment at that particular time, as well as the uh, movement of people and their businesses in uh, West Africa. And uh, Ghana look into it. And uh, not only that, I think this thing there are certain things that we have to be resolved on bilateral levels. And that is why the door was actually open in which Ghana came to Nigeria. Some, some envoys went to Ghana to be able to resolve this matter. And talk is still on. But this is not to say that Equa Trade Liberalization Scheme, which is the free trade area for the community, is not working. I mean, when the border was closed, <clears throat> you discover that a substantial ETLS product were having problems. Those coming to Nigeria as intermediate product to be able to assist as intermediate products in Nigerian manufacturing sector and those finished goods in Nigeria that are going to other parts of West Africa. So uh, an economic integration has its own problem, but it's not to say that it's not relevant. No, no. Quite a lot of countries in the world, they have economic integration. We have NAFTA, North American Free Trade Area, with United States of America, Mexico, and the Canada. It's having a problem, but they are resolving it. Asian economic integration, within themselves, they have about 65% intra-Asian trade among themselves. It's having a problem. They are resolving it. Even yeah. other parts of the regional economic community in Africa, like the Comesa, like the Sade, they are having internal problem, but they are resolving it. But it's Prof, not just, just a quick in, one. No, the, the challenge... Yes, evidence that prof. you have to stop it. Yes, Prof. The challenge is not whether or not these issues have been dealt with. The challenge is how decisive 
are they being handled in a way that they do not recur? You cited the example of uh, these other regions, but let's just pick about one that is primary to us here, which is the ECOWAS you know, agreement. It's been on for so many years, for you know, upward of 40 years, and then we are still having these issues that you also just cited now. So with that example of what is happening among West African countries, what's the assurance that the problems will not be bigger with you know, after ratified and activated from January, especially among all, you know, countries in Africa? I don't think so that the problem will be bigger, number one. Each member state, ECOWAS, and other regional economic community in Africa, they have been able to see the various problems they encounter. And from Article 12 to Article 29 of, Afri of uh, African Continental Free Trade Area, only four articles and I'm talking of Article 20, Article 21, 24, and uh, 27, that are not talking of trade remedies. Trade remedies, which, which actually protect member states from other measures that can affect them negatively. And uh, at the uh, National Action Committee, which I am a member of, of African Continental Free Trade Area, we are working in this particular area that Nigeria have adequate trade remedies to be able to protect the economy. I think Nigeria is doing everything possible to my own information to be able to make sure that our being integrated in African continental free trade area will not actually result in something that will make Nigeria to be better off. But at home also, there must be some institutional structures. There must be from infrastructural development. We cannot actually say, because we have entered African continental free trade area, then our road must be okay. I mean, Africa will not make a road for us. Mm. No, we're here. You know, Africa I, will not manage our borders. And I think, that's, I think that's I think that's one of the issues. So, I think that's one of the issues Mr. Ayer raised. And it appears as though, you know, we're just figuring this out as we go. So work on infrastructure as we're trading and trying to produce also as we're trading. You know, but I'd like to talk, because you mentioned what we should be doing nationally, or in this case locally, uh, to key into this and ensure that this works for us. And I'd like to begin with uh, Mr. Ayer as we wind down now. I was listening to uh, I mean, government officials speak to some businesses in Ghana, and, and, and the, the message we're passing is, I mean, you need to do all you can to withstand competition when this after comes into force. So the question now is, what kind of messaging or what kind of interaction should governments be having with businesses, maybe businesses that will play major roles in this whole agreement? What kind of messaging should they be getting? Should it be, well, we need to protect ourselves first, or we need to find a way to key into this? Basically, what should it sound like? The first thing that must happen, businesses must be alert to ensure that um, the free trade pact does not create an opportunity for staging minimal value added production sites close to Nigeria in other countries for export into Nigeria. That must not be allowed to happen. That's one. Number two is, I think the way forward is, you know there is soft power. Soft power is a way of creating trade advantage bilaterally. So what do I mean? When China gives you a loan, you buy Chinese products. Nigeria has always wasted opportunities to use its intervention in African countries to be a staging port for his businesses. So we go and sort out Sierra Leone, no Nigerian business benefits after we leave. We spend treasure and blood in Liberia, no Nigerian business benefits. We were decades in the trenches in South Africa for um, apartheid to come to an end. There was no strategy for making Nigerian professionals be the ones to partner with South African blacks during um, the, um, the post-apartheid days. So the second thing that must happen is that, that, in my view, Nigeria and South Africa, on account of size, plus Rwanda and Botswana, on account of transparency and great international rating, need to come together to find how to become the production hub mm. of Africa. That's what we need to do. Mm. And we must tell businesses, let's ensure. I'm just hoping, at best, uh, I think that in the next five to ten years, I think the best that will happen is that Akfa will not make Nigeria worse off. I think the worst is that it may make us worse than we are. That is what businesses must avoid at all costs. I'm talking okay. about businesses. Right. Uh, so, pardon me, Cardi. Um, 
One of the things that a number of uh, businessmen who have come into Nigeria, businesses that have come into Nigeria have complained about is the systems. Um, you would remember um, Richard Branson of the Virgin Group. He had complaints that, you know, the, his system, his interventions were frustrated by people, you know, the various systems always asking for bribes and all of that. Same thing with Strive Masiwa, Economic Econet Wireless MD, who assembled a consortium of 22 mostly institutional investors. And um, most of the time, it was always, the, he, he also alleged, you know, that a lot of people asked for bribe and all of that. Calvin Burgess of uh, Dominion Rice and Integrated Farms also said the same thing. You know, people always asking them for bribes and all of that. So on the one hand, we are talking about governments. And then you have talked about businesses. These are individuals. Government is made up of individuals that are going to execute certain policies. Those things would probably also play a major role. And it's not just in Nigeria. It's about, it's in every country in Africa, from the north to the south, from the east to the west. Are we ready? Well, because when we talk about the institutions, we're talking about individuals sure. that are going to run these institutions sure. and sure. make them work. So uh, where do we go from there? I, you know, as, as I've said before on this program, um, progress in Nigeria is not possible with the level of corruption we have. I hope in next year there is some work I've done, some research I've done, which I hope I'll be able to publish. There is a very strong correlation between economic growth and transparency. There are only two sub-Saharan African countries that are bucking the trend and recording significant rates of growth in per capita income. Those are Botswana and Rwanda. They are the only two African countries whose scores on Transparency International is above 50. So I, let me just come back to what you said and let me re reinforce it. If we don't deal with corruption, progress cannot happen with this level. And that's where some of us are very disappointed with this regime. One of the reasons, one of the things we expected in 2015 is that by 2020, the kind of progress Nigeria should have made in transparency will be significant. You know, we haven't done that. And then to make matters worse, you know, there are recent trends towards what some of us think are despotic acts. It's very, very painful. But coming back to the economic issues, it is not possible. And I can, I can put my last penny on it. A country that is as corrupt as Nigeria is cannot progress. It just will not happen. I've studied, there are just one or two exceptions in the whole world that, are, that people are trying to find out, I mean, that researchers are trying to find out how come this country is this corrupt? There's one of them in Europe, one of the G7 countries in Europe. Now, how come this country is this developed? But is this corrupt? But imagines, you know, um, growth, transformation with this level of corruption. I wish I could say it in Yoruba. Kosheshe. It is not possible. Okay, well, you actually did say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Prof, uh, as we wind down, what problem must we solve and market, to use my, my, my colleague's word here, to ensure that this agreement actually works in the favor of Nigeria? in our own case. Thank you. I think I support the last speaker that uh, corruption is a major issue and then it has to be tackled and then that is number one. Number two, Nigeria is prepared to ratify this treaty and therefore the next thing after ratification is domestication of the treaty. What does that one mean? We have to plant the treaty into our various ministries, departments and agencies, the MDAs. That is, there are certain things they are doing which will no longer be tolerated. So this has to be packaged and then be sent to National Assembly for policy adjustment so that we can actually be doing what the treaty is saying, including the corruption which um, uh, he has been talking about. Because there is a major issue. It's very, very bad. For some of us that happen to travel out of this country, we know what we face. When you come to Nigeria, they take you to special rooms. It's annoying. Okay. I think well, we need to solve it. Yeah. But more importantly is that after the ratification, which is coming up immediately, the Minister of Justice finished uh, the ratification document for the president to, to, to assign, to be sent to AU, and then from there on, immediately, 
domestication of the various policies that touches on African continent for well, trade union. Well, Prof, we, 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 we appreciate your thoughts, and but unfortunately we have uh, completely run out out of time. Uh, for okay. this day. We'll have to thank you very much. Professor Jonathan Aremu is Professor of International Economic Relations, Covenant University, Ogun State. Thank you so much for your time. And we have also thank had you. Mr. Kola Ayaya, who is an economist and CEO, GDL Asset Management Limited. Thank you very much thank for having so. me. Thank you very much.